you. Thank you, Jerry, and thank you, uh, Matt, and all the speakers you heard this evening. Thank you for coming. Uh, you are obviously a exceptional audience because uh, you must be in the third category of voters, which is uh, the voters of conscience. They're hereditary voters who vote for whoever the nominee is, depending on Republican, Democrat, and their grandparents were Republican and Democrat. Tactical voters who are uh, skeptical of both parties, but go for the least worst. And then are the voters of conscience. The pioneering voters in American history have always been the voters of conscience. <laughs> At this lectern in 1860, Abraham Lincoln uh, spoke, introduced himself to the New York politicians. This is exactly the same lectern. This is a histor historic hall, and we hope this will be a historic year. Abraham Lincoln in the Republican Party was the last third party to win a presidential election, but not the last third party or independent candidacy to affect the redirections of our country. Historically, because of the two-party duopoly and the rigged system, it takes constant effort, it takes constant initiatives by people who have been excluded and who have been overcome by the statutory ballot access barriers and other impediments. But they persist. They persisted in the Liberty Party in 1840 against slavery and the Women's Right to Vote Party and all those progressive parties, the Greenback Party, the Workers' Party, the Farmers' Party. Where would we be without the voters who decided to leave the two major parties and to vote their conscience, to vote for what they believe in. <clears throat> Here in New York City, in New York State, you will not see Barack Obama or John McCain campaigning. Because of the lead Obama has, he's taken the safe for granted, won't waste his time. And because of the number two far behind position of McCain, he's written it off. A majority of Americans this year live in states like that. They live in states that are either slam dunk Republican, slam dunk Democrat. They will not have a chance to be heard because the two major party campaigns will never go there other than to collect money from places like Beverly Hills. You have Texas, Arizona, you have Illinois, you have California, New York, Massachusetts, New, New Jersey. Many states will never see the two major presidential candidates. That is disrespectful of the voters in this country. If you run for president, you must do what Nader Gonzalez has done. You run in every state of the union, 50 states. And we've been in 50 states, and we've even been in states where we have been excluded from the ballot, five of them. And even in one, this is the worst of all, Oklahoma, that won't even count write-in votes. This is a two-party dictatorship. It's gotten its ultimatum, either Republican or Democrat, in the minds of tens of millions of voters since they were children. A few days ago, a mother of a nine-year-old boy came up to me in Fargo, North Dakota, uh, with a sheaf of materials documenting how Scholastic Magazine brainwashes 18 million children with the support of all too many teachers. And they engaged them in mock uh, elections. And there are only two there. It's McCain and Obama. And there's a big square for other with no names. Uh, and page after page, the assumption is for these children, you've got two choices, and that's it. The little boy wanted to vote for me. And, and his teacher said, and, and his teacher <laughs> And his teacher said, no, you cannot vote for Ralph Nader. You have to vote for one of the two. So he reluctantly voted for Obama, the default candidate in <laughs> western Minnesota. But uh, look up Scholastic and see how early it starts. The denial of voter choice 
the de denial of proven redirections laced with justice and humanity that are not expostulated by the two parties. How the voters are so turned off or bored uh, or feel so powerful, powerless that they don't even vote, half of them. And so today, I, I really want to start with, with us, the people, before we analyze this remarkable collapse of corporate capitalism and what the consequences and opportunities uh, can be uh, for multiple uh, party politics and also the critical civic action that often precedes it uh, and, or, and parallels it. Marcus Cicero defined power as uh, defined freedom as participation in power. By that he meant civic power. That was 2,100 years ago. Wisdom is wisdom, right? Even without emails. Uh, now let's take that. Let's take that definition. Freedom is participation in power. Apart from asking us uh, by that definition, how much power do we have? What is left for us to decide? in this country as people other than our personal uh, lives with increasingly restrictive limitations. But we should never con confuse personal freedom with civic freedom. Even in dictatorships, there's quite a bit of personal freedom as long as you stay out of politics. And in our country, we have a lot of personal freedom. We can eat what we want. We can look at the television show we want. We can use the clicker and shut off all kinds of channels if we want. <laughs> uh, we, we can wear what we want. We can date who we want. We can marry who we want. We can divorce who we want. We can sleep when we want. We can get up when we want on weekends. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of personal freedom. We can even get into a, a 5,000 pound car and go down three blocks to buy chiclets if we want. <laughs> That's not, pers that's not civic freedom. And so let us not per confuse personal freedom with civic freedom because it's civic freedom that deals with the participation in the great uh, issues that confront an organized society and our world. And indeed, uh, civic freedom is the kind of freedom that was denied us with this Wall Street $700 billion bailout. Back when I was about 10 years old and I was sitting at a dinner table with my parents and my older siblings, my, my father and mother would always have rather serious uh, conversations and never allowed us to complain about the food that, thought, that interfered with communication and nutrition. And my father said, uh, children, why will capitalism always survive? And after a few feeble attempts at answering, we said, you tell us, Dad. And he said, because capitalism will always make sure that socialism saves it. And look how prescient that is today. But of course, it's not real socialism. It's subservient socialism. It's the socialism of a personal valet to the Wall Street crooks, swindlers, speculators, and self-enrichers while they drain trillions of dollars of other people's money, as Justice Louis Brandeis once put it. Uh, when watching this unfold in Congress in two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I couldn't help but feeling that these corporate Goliaths, these CEOs, who were so greedy in enriching themselves that they tanked their own companies, some of them hundreds of years old, they un unemployed hundreds of thousands of workers. They're going to throw this city into a very serious recession. They're going to deplete tax revenues, direct and indirect. They go to very, very needy people and necessary facilities. And these corporate crooks and swindlers and speculators and self-enrichers jump ship into a golden lifeboat. And then their withering institutions moved to Washington. I got the feeling that they were laughing at us, mocking us, daring us to do anything. In effect, they were saying, 
we're going to subvert what's left to your standard of living, so you better pay the bill. There were no public hearings in Congress bringing the best minds and the sentiments of workers and taxpayers and consumers to bear. The only hearings were senators and representatives questioning Chairman of the Federal Reserve and Secretary Treasury Paulson recently from, uh, becoming, from uh, the CEO uh, office of Goldman Sachs. They shut out the American people and they sold the American people down the river and handed them a $700 billion blank check garnished by some of the residuals of Democratic Party cowardliness to dress it up. And here we are from 1775 when we were 13 colonies to 2008, 1775, 13 colonies under King George III, 2008, 50 colonies under King George IV, and taxation without representation. <laughs> the principal difference is that King George III was afraid that the col colonials would revolt. Is King George IV? and the Democratic Party complic complicity afraid that the American people will revoke. They can start on November 4th by voting for Nader Gonzalez. <laughs> for over 40 years, we met the test of persistence, of stamina, of defending the interests, the health, safety, and economic well-being of the American people in Washington, D.C. and around the country with the dozens and dozens of groups that have been spawned out of our efforts starting in the mid-1960s. We have met the test, the test of commitment. We have been able to do even what Oscar Wilde once said he couldn't do which was resist everything but temptation. And yet, coming into 2008, we have been excluded once again from the presidential debates. A company dressed up as a commission on presidential debates created and owned by the two major, major parties for the last 21 years to exclude all competition. We have been excluded in spite of every major poll since 2000, where a majority of the people wanted Ralph Nader on those debates, and I'm sure they'd want Matt Gonzalez on that one vice presidential debate. It's, it's quite interesting. I think the American people want us on the debates because they don't just look at the debates as an antidote to insomnia, do they? <laughs> we have been excluded completely from the national television networks, ABC, CBS, NBC, since day one in February when I announced on Meet the Press with the revered late uh, Tim Russert. We have been excluded or attempted to be excluded from many states because of the outrageous Jim Crow type ballot access obstacles to candidate rights which are critical to, to voter rights. What good are voter rights when you just have gerrymandered districts uh, one party dominated, Republican or Democrat, for over 90% of the House of Representative districts and many state legislative districts, when the only choice is the incumbent. I remember years ago when the Kremlin would proudly announce that 98% of the, of the Soviet people turned out to vote. And we'd all chuckle, huh? Because there was only one candidate per line. Well, what's happened to our country? They can't even stand each other to compete the Republicans and Democrats. Despite this, we have persevered because of people like you around the country who ask the question not what's the least worst, thus making dom no demands on the least worst because you don't want to have the worst, thus allowing the corporate interests to pull both 
Republican, Democrat, their way 24-7, while the liberals and the progressives don't pull their way because they're so scared, they put a nose ring in a tether and handed it to the Democratic Party. Why should the Democratic Party give them the time of day? They have lost their bargaining power. But not you, and not other people like you around the country, because you know if you don't vote for what you believe in, for who you believe in, for the candidates that say there must be a shift of power from the corporate hegemonists to the people of this country as befits the preamble to our Constitution, we the people, if you don't vote for that kind of agenda, you are in complicity with the corporate Democrats and the corporate Republicans because you will be facilitating a constant slide into the abyss, a dying dynamic of a dwindling democratic society. It's quite, it's quite curious, historically, that most third-party independent candidates pioneer agendas that are in their incipiency. They're supported by a minority of people. Uh, the great reforms always start out this way. Our politics is so decayed that the Nader Gonzalez agenda is supported in most of its items that you can see by hitting the issue page on, on the uh, votenader.org website by a majority of the American people. Our, our, our positions are supported by a majority of the American people, but they're opposed or ignored by Obama and McCain, supposedly the two majority parties. We come into this campaign with important majority positions that are long overdue for changing our society. We come in with this campaign with the opposition of the two parties against them. We come into this campaign where we take much of our evi em evidence from Main Street media exposés and investigations, including the New York Times, which has blacked us out since February 25th, 60 Minutes on CBS and others, and still, and still the mass media immersed in this iron grip of a two-party duopoly serving corporate interests has the gall to say that they're not covering us because we can't win. That's like saying, we can determine how many tens of millions of people are going to know about your candidacy, and we're going to close the door on these people. Corporate power comes in so many manifestations that we now reflect Franklin Delano Roosevelt's message to the Congress in 1938 when he asked for an investigative commission to be established to investigate corporate power. And he said to the Congress, whenever government is controlled by private economic power, that is fascism. Those are his words, that is fascism. Our, our government is controlled by corporate power Fewer and fewer giant corporations with no allegiance to our country other than to control it or abandon it with its jobs and industries to fascist and communist dictatorships who know how to keep workers in their place, don't they? We are under control department by department, defense, treasury, interior, agriculture, food and drug administration, OSHA, EPA, auto safety. Not even the Department of Labor has escaped the internal and external control of the swarm of corporate influence and power over Washington, D.C., corporate-occupied territory. They have put their top executives in high government positions. They have 10,000 political action committees funneling money relentlessly into the coffers of the politicians. And, of course, 35,000 lobbyists linked to lobbying networks throughout the country. What chance do the people in this country have with this merger where giant corporations take over government, use it for their own accounts receivables, and turn it against the interests of the American people. Both Lincoln, Jefferson, Madison, Theodore Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, had the most excoriating criticisms 
of the mercantile interests, the mercantile interests, the merchant classes, the corporations. But relentlessly, these corporations obtained all the constitutional rights that real people have, except the Fifth Amendment. These artificial entities were never given these equal constitutional rights by any legislature. They were given it by a rogue Supreme Court decision in 1886, where even the decision didn't give the railroad equal protection under the laws in the 14th Amendment. It was the railroad scribe that wrote it in the head notes as a phony summary of the opinion, and then subsequent Supreme Court opinions picked up on it, until we have this grotesque situation where on the one hand we're told we have equal justice under the law, and on the other hand we have equal justice between we and Exxon, we and General Motors, we and Citibank, we and Pfizer, who have all those privileges and immunities and can be a thousand places at once and create their children's subsidiaries without any birth control pills, create their parent holding companies, lobby, politic, engage in elections. They should be stripped of all their constitutional rights because they're not human beings. Only human beings should have constitutional rights. This is, a, this is the greatest silent coup d'etat in American history. Artificial entities being given the constitutional rights in a constitution where the word corporation doesn't exist, where the constitution starts, we the people, in the preamble, not we the corporations. And yet, the two major parties, of course, will never talk about this. Never. We're not talking about the employees of the companies. But at least Business Week magazine in the year 2000 editorialized, quote, corporations should get out of politics, end quote. And that's what they meant. They are not human beings. They don't vote. They don't have children. They don't, have, they don't die in Iraq. Corporations make money in Iraq. And that's got to be a major issue in political campaigns at the local, state, and national level because that is absolutely critical to the subordination of the corporate entity to the sovereignty of the people instead of what it is now, the subordination of the people's sovereignty to the hegemony of the corporate entity. More and more global, more and more no allegiance, more and more going to Washington or other state capitals to be bailed out for their crookery and their speculation on the backs of the people themselves. The corporations are planning our future. Just consider, they're planning our educational futures, corporatizing education. They're planning our political futures, our economic futures, World Trade Organization, NAFTA, all the other things we know about. They're planning our tax system future. They have been planning our governmental future. They have been planning our environmental future by blocking the purity and the efforts to clean the environment. They're planning our oceanic futures. They're planning our, on, our, on our drinking water future. They have been planning our genetic future, Monsanto and genetic engineering. They have been planning restricting access to the courts when we're wrongfully injured and defrauded. We are the ones who are being restricted from having our full day in court before judge and jury, not corporations. There are no restrictions on corporations using the courts, is there? Now, isn't it time that we begin planning our future? They're planning our childhood's future. The commercialization of childhood has never reached the heights or depths in world history, bypassing parents, undermining parental authority with junk food, junk drink, violent programming, and other depreciations of these young children's minds and bodies. When are we going to start planning our future? Take this $700 billion bailout. I was in front of the U.S. Treasury yesterday demanding that Hank Paulson, who brought, profited from this deregulation he pressed for in 1999 and 2000 under the Clinton administration, uh, he made half a billion, 600 million or so, uh, and left in 2006. 
And I said, you know, you should give back $200 million. Share the sacrifice a little. Put it in the $700 billion bailout fund. Huh? <laughs> Demonstrate your moral authority to govern. Don't bet he's going to respond to the letter, although I took it right to the door of the Treasury. Uh, notice what Congress uh, 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 omitted from that bill. Uh, Washington had Wall Street over the barrel. They wanted $700 billion. And they had them over the barrel. They could have forced Wall Street to accept anything. Instead, they did not put in the bill comprehensive re-regulation, which would prevent this in the future. They did not put in the bill more authority for shareholders like worker pension funds and mutual funds to control the company they own and control the excesses and greed of their bosses. They didn't put a real thorough taxpayer ownership uh, power. It's very porous, porous and easily uh, evaded. So if the taxpayer is going to put money in Citibank or you know, the investment banks and so on, that they have uh, ownership power and they have representation on the board of directors, they didn't do that. They didn't provide for expanded criminal prosecution of these Wall Street crooks, crooks and the disgorgement of their ill-gotten gains. And they didn't even require the speculators to pay for their own bailout. Here's how they could have done it. Other countries have this kind of stock transaction tax, the UK, for example. Uh, stock transaction tax were used to fund, uh, help fund the Civil War. Franklin Delano Roosevelt had it. And then it was abolished after World War II. Here's how it would work. Because of high velocity computerized trading and derivatives, there are going to be $500 trillion in derivative transactions traded this year. $500 trillion. A one-tenth of 1% 1 tax would produce $500 billion. And that would, that would make the, the, the speculators pay for their own bailout. And they didn't even do that. But there's still time for this to be done. When Congress comes back, maybe after the election, lame duck session, maybe that, then they will impeach the most impeachable president in American history. They'll have no more excuses. The criminal war in Iraq, high crimes and misdemeanor one, systemic torture, high crimes and misdemeanor two, Imprisoning Americans without filing charges, denying of habeas corpus, high crimes and misdemeanor three. Snooping on millions of Americans without judicial warrant, high crimes and misdemeanor four. And President Bush signing a statement saying he'll decide whether to obey the law he is now signing that Congress sent to him. Now, even the conservative American Bar Association, very conservative, full of Republican lawyers, sent three white papers to George W. Bush in 2005 and 6, documenting and declaring that he is in continual serious violation of the Constitution. So maybe in the lame duck session, uh, they will have uh, some moxie, the Democratic Party, um, or next year to put in comprehensive regulation and shareholder authority and a speculator tax. And by the way, that speculator tax can reduce taxes on working families. It can reduce uh, uh, taxes uh, on, uh, on other things, such as the necessities of life with sales tax. Isn't it interesting how we grow up corporate? We never draw these comparisons. Uh, we own the public lands. The corporations control them, mining, timber, offshore, oil, all. Uh, we own the public airways, the radio and TV stations, control 24 hours a day, don't pay us any rent. We're the landlords, they're the tenant. And they decide who says what and who doesn't 24 hours a day. We control trillion, own trillions of dollars of government research and development, which are given in the form of clinically tested drugs and other innovations that have built the semiconductor, biotech, pharmaceutical, aerospace, containerization industries. And we don't control any of this, and we don't even get any, any credit for it. I once wrote 100 CEOs of U.S. companies and said, why don't you make April 15th Taxpayer Appreciation Day, huh? Have a little, a little reception in, 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 in your interest of it. At any rate, we cannot just leave this bailout the way it is because it's a horrible precedent. 
In effect, it is further concentrating power and fewer and fewer giant corporate hands, and they're going to do it again. They're going to do it again, and they're going to do it again. They did it in the SNL debacle. They did it in long-term management debacle. They did it in the dot-com debacle. And they will do it again and again until we say never again. I, I say this because these are systemic failures. They're not a few rotten apples in the barrel. The whole barrel is rotten. Look who failed their fiduciary responsibility that led to this collapse on Wall Street, big one today, and it's ricocheting against innocent workers, taxpayers, and consumers throughout the country and people with retirement savings. Look at, look at, look at, look who failed. The fiduciary responsibility of the offices of these banks and investment banks and brokerage firms. Then the board of directors looked the other way. Then the corporate law firms looked the other way. And then the audit accounting firms looked the other way. Why did they look the other way? Because they were paid to look the other way. And then the state regulators failed. And then the federal regulators failed. What's left of regulation? So the whole Penelope of safeguards that the American people thought were securing their hard-earned dollars in trust by these corporate institutions was seriously breached and detonated. This is a systemic failure, and we've got to recognize it as such. And it will never change until corporations are structurally, constitutionally, subordinated to the sovereignty of the people in specific ways or displaced by community economic self-reliance. Displacement or subordination of giant corporations must be the agenda of the future. Every time organic farming in small plots expands around markets, agribusiness giants get weaker. Every time we have energy conservation and renewable decentralized solar and geothermal, Exxon, Peabody Coal, and the uranium nuclear corporations get weaker. Their sales decline. Every time, every time we have community health that deals with prevention, good diet, no addictions, exercise, and community health facilities run by, run by the consumers with skilled practitioners, the giant health insurance companies, HMOs, and drug companies decline in influence. And you can add to those examples. So it's either displacement of the operations of these corporations by community self-reliance, or it is subordination structurally so that never again they can achieve the power they have achieved because they have the same constitutional rights we have to engage in elections, politics, and other public activities that should only be restricted to human beings. Uh, we, Nader Gonzalez come up with a, a very rare proposal that has three benefits. One is to, is to demand a national amnesty for all nonviolent drug offenders and empty the jail cells of them. Second, second by an expanded prosecutorial resource base convict these corporate crooks and throw them in those empty jail cells. And they're not, they're not just financial crooks, they're corporations who have jeopardized or destroyed the lives of workers because of occupational disease and trauma, 58,000 a year, according to OSHA, uh, worker deaths every three weeks more than 9-11, and it happens every three weeks. Three weeks after three weeks. 65,000 deaths, horrible. Asphyxiation, cancer from air pollution every year. EPA, heavily from the coal burning plants. 100,000 people dying because of medical negligence in hospitals, at least, according to the Harvard School of Public Health 
physicians. These corporations are not just lying, cheating, and stealing, as one prosecutor pointed out. They are affecting seriously the health and safety of the American people. <clears throat> and then the third benefit of this trilogy is, for those of us who are interested in prison reform, nothing better than to have powerful com convicts in jail. They'll demand reform. They won't stand for the food and the conditions. Isn't it interesting that the US government has got hundreds of billions of dollars to bail out corporate crooks, over $100 billion just for one insurance company, AIG, that cities have billions of dollars to build stadiums instead of neighborhood recreational facilities. <laughs> They have, they have billions of dollars uh, to engage in all kinds of corporate subsidies, handouts, giveaways of our resources that we own, like our mineral resources under the 1872 Mining Act. But suddenly they don't have enough money to repair the schools and the clinics, expand the libraries, to clean up the drinking water systems, to, to improve the sewage treatment systems, to repair the bridges and the highways and the public transit. Uh, they don't have money for that. What does that tell you? That tells you we live in a de facto dictatorship of priorities where the few are funded by the many and the many are defrauded by the few. You'll see, you saw in the recent debates, there was some reference to the deficit. And they said, well, how are you gonna deal with the deficits? They're getting bigger and bigger. Now we got another $700 billion one coming up. And you know some, neither McCain and Obama ever mentioned the two biggest source of the deficits. One is the bloated, wasteful military budget. The military budget is one half of the federal government's operating expenditures is no more Soviet Union. Well, what are we dealing with? The criminal gang that we have to have Trident submarines and uh, aircraft carriers? That, that, that'll, really, that's, that'll really go for it. Um, corporate subsidies, bloated military budget, taboo for McCain and Obama. Both of them want to increase the military budget. They've said it again and again. It is a taboo. It is not discussable in two-party politics in our country. And have they ever met a corporate subsidy they don't like? Corporate welfare has reached unprecedented heights, not just direct handouts, giveaways, but all the ways they maneuver the tax system to indirectly send uh, rich companies like Cisco and Microsoft and Intel what are called tax credits. They hardly need it, but they get checks from the Treasury nevertheless. I think uh, if you looked at the last two debates, and so-called, they're really parallel interviews, and someone asked you, who won the debate? He asked me, who, who do you think won the debate? I told him that's the wrong question. The question is, what won and what lost? And let me conclude uh, with this list. Here's what won the two debates. Militarism won. The military-industrial complex that Eisenhower warned about one, corporate crime, one, criminal injustice system, one, never even discussed, death penalty, one, the banksters, one, the gigantic deficits that are funding the criminal war in Iraq, funding the oppression of the Palestinian people, funding more war in Afghanistan and Pakistan. That's who won. The prison industrial complex won. The, 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 the nonsensical boomeranging war on drugs won. The bailout won. Now who, who lost? What lost, rather? Well, the interests of the people, taxpayers, workers, consumers, obvious. The Israeli-Palestinian peace movement lost. Peace advocacy, lost. 
withdrawal from Iraq rather than gobbledygook about leaving 50,000 troops and the military bases there and calling it withdrawal, lost. Poverty lost, 100 million Americans, one third of our country on the lower rank of the income ladder is undiscussable. All they talk about is the middle class, which is dwindling into poverty before their very eyes. Obama and McCain, oh, they're doing everything for the middle class. What about the bottom 100 million Americans who are underpaid and overcharged, who are excluded, who are marginalized, who do the dirty work, who do the dangerous work for us, who, who are ripped off more as consumers, the pay, poor pay more, who die earlier because they don't have health insurance. 18,000 Americans die because they can't afford health insurance, according to the Institute of Medicine, National Academy of Science. The Urban Institute puts it higher. Just think of that. Hundreds of thousands get sick, stay sick, and don't have their injuries uh, attended because they can't afford health insurance. Nobody in Canada, Belgium, Luxembourg, France, Italy, Sweden, Germany die because they don't, can't ha afford health insurance. They're insured from the day they're born. That's the humanitarian <laughs> universal benefit. One of our great volunteers here in New York, Josh, was riding his bike. He was hit by a limousine that came out without looking properly. And he was slammed down on the ground. He didn't think he was hurt, so he didn't, you know, try to get the name of the limousine owner and so on. And then the next day, he started getting excruciating pain, and he wasn't insured. And here we go again. Goes to a doctor, two, three hundred dollars just to look at it. You may have to have an operation. How much? We don't know. If you don't have the operation, you may have to have your wrist amputated. And he doesn't, he doesn't know what's going on. He's just shuttled back and forth. I told him, you know, maybe you should go to Canada. Huh? Get a, get a Medicare card. There's a, there's a civilized country. Uh, these, these big corporations say they're patriotic, and these politicians say they love America. Well, you don't love America without loving all Americans. It was. Living wage lost. That's what lo lost on those debates. They didn't talk about 47 million Americans who have Walmart wages, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, uh, less than $11 an hour before deductions. That's one third of the American workforce. One third of the American workforce. The minimum wage, if it was adjusted for inflation in 1968, would be $10 today. It's $6.55 federal. It's going backwards into the future as corporate profits swell and the executives are making, like the head, head of Walmart, ten dollars to $11,000 an hour, eight hours a day, week after week. He's got a million workers making eight, nine, seven, ten bucks an hour. So ask yourself tonight, what won and what lost? If you had a broader framework of debate with other third-party independent candidates, there's only four more who qualify theoretically for an electoral college win, you would have seen even more clearly how insipid, cowardly, belligerent those, those exchanges were by Obama and McCain. It was Eugene Debs, and I, I heard that Matt me mentioned Eugene Debs, the great labor leader of the late 19th and early 20th century. And it was said, at the end of his career, he was asked by a reporter, Mr. Debs, what's your greatest regret? He said, my greatest regret? Here's my greatest regret, is that under the Constitution, the American people can have almost anything they want, but it just seems like they don't want much of anything at all. That shows how low our expectation level is compared to Western Europe. Out of the rubble of World War II, when we emerged as the most powerful government and country in the world, out of the rubble of World War II, the destitution, the poverty, the hunger, the starvation, the 50% unemployment in Western Europe, the people of Western Europe through their trade unions, their cooperatives, through their multi-party system, their proportional representation, giving smaller coalitions a voice, their instant runoff voting. They demanded and received by law for all their people in their country, universal health care, decent wages, decent pensions, four-week paid vacation,
decent public transit, paid maternity leave, decent daycare, pay, paid family sick leave, and university free tuition. 63 years later, we don't have this in our country. We don't have any of this by law for all the people in our country. And we're supposed to be the richest country in the world. The Republicans and Democrats for 63 years didn't deliver the basic social benefits of a productive economy. They didn't deliver in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. Republicans and Democrats didn't deliver in the 80s and 70s and 90s and in this decade. How many more years? How many more decades? How many more Americans die? How many more Americans have to get sick? How many more Americans have to live lives of anxiety, job insecurity, year, years accumulated time away from their family, job and a half, commuting and congested traffic? With, how many more years are going to wait? That's what you should ask your friends and your neighbors. I, for one, don't want to wait any more at all. Matt. Matt Gonzalez does not want to wait any more at all. Our voters around the country, and there are millions of them, according to the CNN poll, do not want to wait any more at all. Because if we wait any longer, we are in complicity with the corrupt corporate two-party system and their corporate paymasters. There is no alternative. If you don't fight them, you're facilitating them. If you don't challenge them, you're being subservient to them. It's very clear in politics that there's no such thing as inaction. Inaction itself is action. Going around the country, I see people supporting us, and it develops a level of trusteeship that has a depth I cannot convey to you. A, Vietnam War veteran, 64 years old, suffering from Agent Orange, sends us $1,300. I call him up and thank him. I say, thank you for contributing after chatting with him. And, and I said, thank you for contributing to our campaign. He said, I'm not contributing to you. I'm contributing to the kind of country I want America to be. Just think of that. Think what that does to Matt and I in terms of the trusteeship and all the volunteers and all the staff that are working their heads and hearts off. Think what that does. Think of a forklift operator, 32 years old, in a food warehouse in Ohio, and he sends us $4,000. And I ask him, why did you do that? You clearly can hardly afford it. And he said quietly, it was my way of protesting. 